Well, welcome to Palm Sunday. Our Lenten journey will be drawing to a close this week. And today, Palm Sunday is a holiday like no other because of the unique combinations of, of things that are involved. We've got adults and children, and we've got light and darkness, and we've got joy and sorrow all wrapped up in one day. And in many ways, these differing messages and emotions were very present on the very first Palm Sunday. And looking at it from Jesus' perspective, Palm Sunday is also the beginning of the end of his rescue mission to our world. The scripture reading for today in Luke focuses on the joy part, and I think rightly so. Today should be a joyful day, but we're going to get into a little bit of everything this morning. So that said, let's dig into the scriptures, and I've also asked our projectionist to have a few slides ready as well so we can see where Jesus was and the disciples were on that day. But first, a little bit of background. During his life, most of his life, Jesus avoided coming straight out and telling people that he was the Messiah, especially if the scribes or Pharisees were nearby. This was probably in order to prevent anyone trying to proclaim Jesus as king of Israel and or prevent his enemies from putting him to death before his work on earth was finished. But today is the day that Jesus will finally declare himself publicly. The evening before Palm Sunday, Jesus and the disciples were staying with Lazarus in Bethany. They had eaten dinner with Lazarus the night before, and we heard that story last Sunday about Mary's expensive perfume and Judas's grouchy comments. Then Palm Sunday morning, the next morning, Jesus and the disciples walked a couple of miles from Bethany to the top of a ridge of mountains to a place called the Mount of Olives, which overlooks Jerusalem. If I could have slide one at this point. There you go. That's the Mount of Olives right there. So Jesus would have been coming in from the upper right-hand side. That's, that's, there's a road up there across the top of the Mount of Olives. There's a road here now. I don't know if there was one back there, a path back then. But they were coming from that direction and kind of coming in this way. And so all in all, from the top of the mountain, it's, it's just over a mile's walk from the top of that mountain, what they used to call a Sabbath day's walk. From there, down the Mount of Olives, across the valley, valley, and up into the temple in Jerusalem. As Jesus and the disciples arrive at the Mount of Olives, at the top there, Jesus sends two of the disciples on a mission to find a colt, a young colt that's never been ridden. Jesus tells them where to find it. And he says, if anyone asks, say the Lord needs it, which they did. And the other gospel writers added the words, and we'll bring it back to you. <laughs> so they did bring it back. Um, and they brought this colt to Jesus, and Jesus sat on it. Now, this is a miracle in itself. Getting on and sitting on a young, untrained animal for the first time without being thrown off. How did this happen? Does the colt recognize its creator's voice? I mean, animals can be smart where it comes to the things of God, smarter than humans sometimes. Remember Balaam and his donkey in the Old Testament? And the donkey had to tell his rider that there were angels blocking the path. The guy didn't see them. So did this colt have some instinct about Jesus? Or was he tamed by a single word from the Lord? Gospel writers don't tell us. They just say the disciples threw their cloaks on the colt, and Jesus got on. While all this was going on, a crowd was gathering at the top of the Mount of Olives, and people started spreading their cloaks on the road ahead of Jesus. And this was an action back then that indicated the presence of a great leader. And then this procession happening on that road at the top of the Mount of Olives could have been seen, and probably was seen, by anyone whose house or building was facing east in Jerusalem. They could have seen some folks up there. So they travel along this road for a bit, across the top of the hill, and then sort of just before those gold domes there, which those gold domes were not there back then, but just before there, 
they would have turned left just a little bit, started heading down, a gentle left, heading down the Mount of Olives. And if I could have the next slide, please. This is what they would have seen from the top of the Mount of Olives. This is Jerusalem. Um, again, the skyscrapers were not there back then, and neither was the gold dome. But everything else is pretty much the way it was back then. Um, and I wanted to show also one other thing. of the wall. Jerusalem is a walled city. It goes, a, it goes A wall goes all the way around it, um, and it had gates. And most of the gates still work. Most of the gates are still there and are still open, and you can, they actually do shut and open uh, various times of the day. That gate, you'll notice, though, has been stoned shut, completely sealed up. That happened somewhere around the year, somewhere somewhere around the year 500 or so, 550, uh, before my time. Anyways, <laughs> um, somewhere around in there, somebody took control of Jerusalem who did not want Jesus to come back. And the prophecy is that Jesus would enter through that gate, which he did on this day, on Palm Sunday, right? But they, they heard about this prophecy and they figured he was coming back again, which is also true. And they say that he's going to enter through that gate. So they didn't want him coming back. And so they sealed it up. <laughs> it's been like that ever since. Like, this is going to stop him, right? <laughs> but there you are. That's, <laughs> that's the story about that gate right there. So this is then Jerusalem pretty much as it would have looked when they were standing at the top of that hill. So they turn left. They're starting to head down the Mount of Olives. Next slide, please. That's more or less the path. And again, back in the day, that would have not been paved, of course, <laughs> a dirt path. Um, but today, if you're there, the left, to the left of that wall is a Jewish cemetery, and on the right of hand of side is a Catholic church called Dominus Flevit, which means Jesus wept. And that's, that's um, what it looks like today. But this would have, the path is in the same place. It's just been changed a little bit. So they would have headed down this path and slowly, as they, came, as they made this turn and as, they, um, as the crowd started to praise God as they, as they made this turn and heading down, the praises started to happen. And they waved palm branches, which are symbols of victory and triumph and peace and eternal life. And they praised God for all the works of power that they had seen Jesus perform, including Lazarus' resurrection they praised God for sending Jesus the Messiah, and they praised God with ancient words written by King David, the heir to whose throne Jesus was and is. And they shouted, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. By now the people in the city, you can see they're getting closer to Jerusalem at this point, the people in the city would be seeing the crowd. You can't miss a crowd on this path. Some of them ran out to join the crowds. Some ran off to the temple to tell the Pharisees and Sadducees what was going on. The Rom Romans looked at this and saw something vaguely resembling the triumphal processions that their military leaders had, except their military leaders would be riding on horses, not donkeys. The symbolism might have looked threatening from a Roman point of view, but Jesus didn't look threatening. On the other hand, there's a, there's a different kind of power about Jesus, a power that brings life and not death. So on this Mount of Olives, there's a celebration going on. Even the children are joining in. And the fact that Jesus enters Jerusalem riding a colt, a donkey, fulfills the prophecy of Zechariah 9.9, where he says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem. Your king comes to you triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The crowd is singing another song, too, as they come down this path. They're singing the words of a song that would go, Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. And this is an echo of the songs that the angels sang at the birth of Jesus back in Luke chapter 2. 
the multitude of disciples like the multitude of angels proclaim Jesus as the Messiah and the King. There were also some Pharisees in the crowd that day, and in Jesus' day, like today, there could be lots of differences of opinion among different groups of people, religious parties. Some Pharisees really despised Jesus, but others really liked him. And these particular Pharisees were in the crowd supporting Jesus, and they're warning Jesus to keep his head down, basically. They are, they've been telling him for some time that Herod wants to kill him. They also understood that a display like this one of what looked like a royal claim might bring down on Jesus' head the wrath of the powerful wherever they may be, whether it be the Sanhedrin or, the, or Herod or Pilate. They're warning Jesus to tell people to be careful, tell his people to be careful what they're saying. And I believe that this was an honest concern on their part. They didn't want to see Jesus or anyone else in the crowd arrested or thrown out of the synagogue. And so they said to Jesus, teacher, order your disciples to stop. But Jesus answered, truly, I tell you, if they were silent, the stones themselves would cry out. There was no stopping this celebration. And Jesus is aware of the danger. He knows what's coming. All of these things are a fulfillment of prophecy. In the Old Testament, Zechariah predicted that the king, the Messiah, would enter Jerusalem riding on a colt and the people would acclaim him. And so they do. And the celebration continues. And that's where our reading for today ends. But that's not the end of the story that day. The very next verse, verse 41, tells us that while all this celebration was going on, Jesus was weeping. The verses are these. As Jesus came near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, If you, even you, had only recognized on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. Indeed, the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up ramparts around you and surround you and hem you in on every side. They will crush you to the ground, you and your children within you, and they will not leave within you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation from God. The failure of the people of Jerusalem to recognize the things that make for peace will have tragic consequences for the city and the nation. Looking out over this city from this place, Jesus can see into the not so distant future when Jerusalem will fall and he is grieving. The year will be 70 AD. The Roman destruction of the city is described by a friend of John Wesley's, Charles Simeon, who wrote, they suffered such calamities from the hands of the Romans as had never been endured by any nation since the foundation of the world. Jerusalem and its people were wiped off the map in the most cruel way possible. And Jesus loves Jerusalem, and so he grieves because things would have been different if the leaders of Jerusalem hadn't, hadn't been threatened by him and had recognized him. The chief priest at the time was famous for saying of Jesus that it was necessary for one man to die to save the nation, which was true, but not the way he meant it. He was afraid that Jesus would start a revolution and the Romans would come down hard on the city, but Jesus never intended to start a revolution. Somebody else did that in the year 70, and that's when the Romans came down hard on the city. Jesus sees all of this as he is looking out over Jerusalem, and in Jesus' lament, Jerusalem is also symbolic of the, nation, the entire nation of Israel and in a larger sense of all humanity. So while the crowds are cheering, Jesus is weeping. Slide four, please. This is the Garden of Gethsemane. The path that we saw in the last slide 
passes through the garden on the way to Jerusalem. Beautiful place. Today there's a four-lane highway right next to it, but it's still quiet in the garden. It's amazing. And so there you are, beautiful. Some of these trees have been there since the time of Jesus. Some of them have, were probably touched by our Lord. The word Gethsemane means olive press. It makes sense on the Mount of Olives that you would have an olive press there. So there you are. This is where Jesus spent his last evening. The procession then, this group of people who are cheering, pass through this garden, and then across, there's a path across the Kidron Valley, and walked up to the Golden Gate, which was still open at the time, where Jesus entered the temple, and then turned over the tables of the money changers. And that's a different story for a different day. For today, it is right that we celebrate Jesus' glorious entry into the city of David, the city that should have been his and someday will be his. Today, we shout along with the crowds and the children, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. A local theologian said this week, from God's perspective, the events of the first Palm Sunday are as much for you and me today as they were the first time Jesus rode into the city. God does not count time as we do. Now, as always, is the day of salvation. So let no one and nothing discourage your joy in Jesus today. We who live in the present time have even more cause for joy than they did back then. We know from the vantage point of time that Jesus will be back three days after his crucifixion. We know more clearly than before, than Jesus, that Jesus' kingdom is not of this world, but that a new heaven and a new earth are on the way. So it is right for us to celebrate this day. Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Amen.